Perfect timing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's Weekend Frivolity, our broiler chicken show. And actually, I was so impressed. Uh, mind you, this library drives me crazy these days. I'm not quite sure. Well, well first off, I guess we ought to see if YouTube's our working. Our broiler chicken show. Hey, there it is. Yeah. And actually, I but. Um, uh, somebody actually um, went and grabbed the soundbite and I got the link here so I suppose I can start off this I wonder if this gets me in trouble with YouTube but what the hell here we go <laughs> oh, that's awesome so uh, thank you, uh, YouTube community, and now uh, you're uh, part of our uh, our history going forward. <laughs> That's totally awesome. Um, so thank you. I can't remember exactly who it was that uh, did that, but uh, that really touched me. I thought that was so cool. So I don't know whether uh, you're going to keep that site up or not, or whether uh, I need to download that soundbite and put it somewhere else. But uh, yeah, yeah. So. Um, you know, interesting, we already have some uh, comments there over on YouTube, and it's, of course it's always a challenge for me to keep uh, keep track of um, <clears throat> all of the um, all of the comments and questions coming in from 20 different directions, and also make sure that this uh, YouTube uh, OBS still works here, so bear with me everybody. Um, now the uh, you know the primary purpose for this uh, weekend show, um, especially while school is in, is to uh, give the students a further sort of support um, on top of the lectures, uh, then on top of the group tutorial session. Uh, you guys just went through this. Is sort of you're okay. I still didn't understand this. Can you give me one more go at this? Um, so um, the TAs in the level one program uh, were collecting sort of add-on questions that uh, Graham sort of said well maybe Brian can touch on this in the uh, BCS so we'll probably uh, spend a good chunk of time uh, looking at that here today um, as well too I uh, I just like to go through my uh, Twitter feed and uh, well you know TRI's Twitter feed um, and um, speak to anything that maybe uh, I noticed uh, caught a bit of traction on any of the public posts that I'd done or if there happened to need sort of clarification on anything that I said. Um, I don't get over to the Facebook page and I've tried to um, uh, send this, uh, this uh, video out uh, onto the Facebook page as well. Uh, I do tweet out um, the uh, the YouTube video uh, in the Twitter feed. So if you follow Twitter, uh, you should be able to get it there. Um, I always have challenges with Facebook. So I'm going to go look at it after we're done here today and, uh, and see if that's working. Um, you know, I suppose we probably all should uh, try and um, take a little step back. Um, you know probably new people to the market right now you're probably you know sadly you, you you might actually even be assuming that this is the way it normally is which it isn't um, you know I've been on this planet for 50 years now oh boy just crossed the big milestone and I can say and also too I fancy myself a student of the market which means I really like uh, to study history and I really like to study uh, cycles and um, you know the basic message I would try and even you know hopefully this reverberates through humanity um, is that um, you know we as a species uh, are part of this universe we really you know and it's interesting like I'm a really big fan of a video called the great the great year which was a con which was an old gr ancient Greek concept um, and understanding cycles over like you know you know tens of thousands of years. Uh, in fact, actually, their big cycles about twenty four thousand years. So if you are interested, you know, go uh, check that out. And I have tweeted it out before. I mean, I know uh, it's kind of boring just watching this dashboard while I'm blabbing away here. 
I should be, you know, showing you videos and links and all that stuff, but I'm not really that good at that kind of stuff. So just, you know, Google uh, the great year, uh, YouTube, whatever, really fascinating video. And in a weird sort of way, it's actually, it makes a lot of sense because when I study a lot of stars in the, uh, in the um, just even the local vicinity, a lot of them are binary stars. So to me, actually, that video makes a lot of sense. Anyway, um, point being that, um we are part of this universe um and we you know through the dark periods of those cycles we try and dislocate ourselves from the universe and uh we try and remove ourselves thank you felipe I already found the youtube link for the people in the lounge maybe i'll even uh, post it on the youtube uh, you guys are so awesome this is why i love tri right it's because we're all sort of very uh, communal thinking, right? And so if somebody's like, oh, yeah, I know what he's talking about. I can grab that link. They just do it really quickly. So thank you. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> now watch this uh, link that he's supposed to be to some cheesy uh, YouTube shill or something. <laughs> bye bye, Alcoid. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this was the uh, link uh, posted. Uh, maybe I better just <laughs> load the link just to make damn sure. Uh, that's Brian and his cynical sense of humor. Uh, yay! <laughs> yeah, the guy with the suspenders. Isn't that funny how that's how he's remembered in history? <laughs> Uh, chart. Yeah, it's it's celestial porn. We're we're handing out celestial porn here. <laughs> oh, it gives a funny Google redirect. So I don't know that that's even gonna work. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I'm just wasting everybody's time. Mind you, this is it's such a good video that honestly, I think it, it's worth taking some time. One, you know, it's, you know, this is Sunday, so maybe if you got some time here today, uh, but. Um, uh, you know, if you're into sort of really expanding your mind, trying to think about, you know, the universe and like the, the bigger role of us and all that kind of stuff, man, I love this kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, I get, where am I trying to go with all this? Um, I mean, you guys have heard me squawk ring repeatedly over the past uh, probably good six months about how I was like, oh my God, six different celestial events all happening in the same year. When has that ever happened before? Ah. You know, it's so funny because, you know, when astrologers jump up and down, people sort of go, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. I mean, you never, and the worst part about life, this is what I've seen just 50 years in, is you never know exactly what the, what is going to be. You know, uh, did ever anybody think that a, I mean, and you can't write better fiction than reality. You know, one of the best scandals in the gold market uh, was back uh, in the 90s uh, when I was just sort of, you know, getting going as a young professional in the business. And at the very end of the scandal, the guy who pulled off the whole scandal, one day he mysteriously just fell out of a helicopter. I mean, you can't be, you know, like it's, you got, you can't, and it, the, the, <laughs> it gets you so worked up when you think about this stuff. Uh, you know, the jungle was so thick that we couldn't possibly send in a rescue team to go look for him. Uh, you can't, you can't be serious. I mean, you this stuff, it's, you know, this crazy world. You, you can't write better fiction than reality. You just can't. <laughs> so don't try. Um, so being a part of this universe um, and um, um, I think we just simply have to acknowledge that we are in a very, very difficult time. Um and as I said, like most new people, like somebody just stumbling upon this page, what's this quack, crazy quack talking about? Um, you just don't realize that this isn't normal. This is uh, very abnormal. And unfortunately, you know, through these periods, the, actually the best thing you can possibly do is just, you know, they often say the best the offense is sometimes a really good defense. I do... Um, I do find it really interesting that it's been about, well, what is it now? Yeah. Jeez, it's been about two and a half years since people have been not so crazy about uh, cryptocurrencies. 
And frankly speaking, when I look out into the world, I think uh, nobody in the public is really that interested in cryptocurrencies. And if anything, you know, if you went to like, you know, family, you know, picnics, if anybody's allowed to right now, you know, and you mention cryptocurrencies, they'd probably be like, oh, you're still into that crazy thing. Oh, geez. Uh, oh, yeah. What's happened to all that? You know, that's the that's the feeling that I'm getting from sort of the public about cryptocurrencies. Uh, so interestingly enough, if you are coming to these videos from a cryptocurrency bent, you're probably so deep into the world, you don't realize that most of the world is kind of forgotten about us. And and we've almost sort of, in my opinion, uh, become like almost like a footnote. Um, I do think, in my opinion, and this of course is just my opinion, um, is that a good time for investors to be interested in markets when the public really isn't really that interested? Uh, you know, obviously the, uh, you know, if you've been watching my videos, then you'll understand that basically that is exactly when we should be most interested. So uh, the public really isn't that interested. Certainly don't see, you know, if I turn on the TV, nobody's talking about cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin or any, anything along those lines. Um, I do find it interesting that even now, when governments and stuff even tried to probe the idea of getting more involved in cryptocurrency, there was a wicked backlash. Um, and they were quickly uh, rebuffed. I think they would like to move towards more cryptocurrency kind of environment. I think, you know, the government higher ups have bought the idea and they understand that is basically our future. So I do find it fascinating that in that last government bailout bill, there was a there was a push to try and get cryptocurrency going into the mainstream and it got rebuffed very hard, rebuffed very hard. Um so, you know, you put it all together, um, a lot of the public messages I've been given, uh, been giving lately have been, you know, this is a very dangerous uh, time in our longer term demographic cycles. We are transitioning from one generation to another. Uh, that transition period usually has to have some sort of reset you know, and the, you know, the, the banksters slash, um, um, paid for university professors, we'll call it the economic cycle. <laughs> Watch the money masters uh, video that I often make reference to in these videos and you'll understand uh, what that joke is all about. Um, but, um, I might argue, yeah, let's let's call it the bank cycle. I might argue, actually, we might actually even right now be in the process of the 1% transferring all of that wealth from the baby boomer generation, and they're really old. They're going to transfer that wealth to uh, back to the bank's balance sheets. Um, you know, do they monkey around with interest rates to try and force force foreclosures? I think they did that in 2008. Um, my feeling here is um, we all know the, uh, the, the story of the Rothschilds and how they often like to back both sides of uh, uh, you know antagonistic situations um, and and the clause in all of the loans of course is the winner will uh, how does it go <laughs> I, the, 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 the clause when I read it it was just like oh Jesus now I understand how the damn games played in almost all of these loans that they give to these warlords uh, it says right in the damn fly print uh, the um, the winner will honor the debts of the vanquished. So in essence, the banks can't lose. <laughs> oh, it drives you crazy. I mean, I hope that's not what's going on right now. Uh, I do believe that to a certain degree, the uh, bankers have milked the shit out of the U.S. dollar. And they have milked the shit out of this, uh, this, um, this uh, entity. I think they've milked the shit out of almost all the world currencies. 
So does that mean we have to go through a massive reset, just like we did sort of through First World War or Second World War? Um, and, um, and you know, in that case, we, sh we moved to this thing called the U.S. dollar system. And it took, you know, that took about, what, 20, 30, 40 years to make the full transition out of that sort of European empire mentality into this modern world, Cold War world we lived in. Uh, does it take 20, 30 years? I'm hearing a lot of talk about people talking about the uh, world. I said on the site, a lot of people are posting around this video, uh, the World Economic Conference or the World Economic Forum or something like that. Uh, where they just map out this sort of plan, how do we transition into this world, one world currency? I'll tell you, the uh, United States government and the United States system, it's taken a real, I mean, they are just gutting it. You know, it's quite shocking. It's happening right, right in front of our eyes, so... The worst part about it is it's probably going to lead to like a period of hyperinflation uh, for things like grocery prices, I'm already starting to hear lots of headlines about uh, rising fruit food prices all over the place. And so, you know, all these baby boomers that saved up tons and tons of money through their lives, maybe they bought and paid off their houses. So in essence, what's the easiest way to remove that wealth from them? Just create hyperinflation where it costs like $50 to buy a loaf of bread. I mean, you'll go through that equity in your house pretty damn quick. So um, I don't know what the hell the banker's uh, plan here is. Um, I think it's a good idea to try and thank you, Shark Toshi. <laughs> Again, I love how our site, you know, we're constantly, people are constantly sort of reiterating. So Shark Toshi just put the Money Masters uh, video in the uh, lounge. Um, so, you know, try to play from a position of strength. Understand that this is an extremely difficult period. My suggestion to all of you is, you know, the number one way that you get rid of, and actually this is a level one program term that um, you should, oh, I guess it's next week, the level oneers when we get into how do portfolio managers actually get rid of risk. They have to be invested. There must be something that they do to try and offset risk. What do you do? Oh, this is a question. Let's see, YouTubers. If I have to be invested, what do you do to try and reduce risk? I mean, this is a very risky world. And, you know, Germany, uh, the German currency, it got to the, and keep in mind, Germany, you know, rah, rah, World War One. you know, when they were like an empire kind of idea. Um, and by 20, you know, 10, 20 years later, they had to take a wheelbarrow money to buy a loaf of bread. So what do you do to offset that risk? That might happen in the United States of America. I mean, <laughs> government, central banks printing $2 trillion. I think it's the, uh, the, uh, the, um, um, the uh, U.S. government just approved $2 trillion, and then there's another $3 trillion coming down here. I mean, psh, the value of money is collapsing in front of our eyes, people. Just get used to it. Um, so the answer, of course, is, uh, is, uh, rocker <laughs> and, you know, and it's so cool because, uh, and I say it every, every video, but every time I see you, dude, you can put a smile on my face for the rest of my life because, uh, uh, a gentleman I really respect in the industry and I send a lot of people, as many people from our, uh, site education program that want to become funded, uh, uh, prop traders. I, al I always suggest they go to top step. And uh, so cool. Uh, they have like a fun little free video they do uh, uh, in the mornings. And I think it's a great way for our guys who really want to be prop traders to get into the habit of, of going to those meetings and just being ready uh, at, you know, the opening bell to rock it. Um, and uh, Mr. Hoagland, who's uh, one of the uh, principals at that firm, he actually does this cool little <laughs> rocker, total 1970s uh, salute to uh, rocker uh, in the mornings. It's just so awesome. Uh, I, I just a, You know what that is? That's a little slice of reality that I'll never forget. You can't put a price on it. It's so beautiful. And, of course, it would have never happened if we had not done this. It's uh Little slice of uh, beautiful karma. <laughs> We've really struck a chord with a rocker. Totally cool. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, back to the conversation. Um, so, uh, what do you do to try and mitigate the risk? And of course, you can never mitigate risk in financial terms. You can take to, um, you can take steps to try and reduce it, but the answer, of course, is to diversify. Um, and frankly speaking, that's not such a bad idea. I mean, um, I hate to say it, I think uh, on balance, you know, Europe has been going through a crunch time. You know, the U.S. has been sort of carrying the weight. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's, you know, a good 20, 30 years where the United States and North America has to go through sort of a very quiet period. You know, uh, Europe went through that horrible, especially Eastern Europe at the end of the century, uh, where there was hyperinflation and the, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, ironically enough, I, I used to joke years ago that I actually thought that the end of this cycle would have to see the end of the last of the remaining Cold War adversaries. And we might actually just be seeing that unfolding right in front of our eyes, I'll tell you. And the worst part about it is, from my perspective, is that this actually, this situation could be manageable. But what's the one thing that this situation really needs right now? It needs one thing, and it needs one thing only. Starts with an L. I can't think of what it could possibly um, uh, rhyme with. <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody know where I'm going? And it's the one thing we just don't have right now. And it's so sad. Uh, well, the, okay, so you always need that. So Colleen and Felipe, actually, they trumped me here. So, oh, how ironic. <laughs> I used that word. <laughs> Uh, uh, so a couple people in the uh, in the lounge uh, just trumped my word with the word love <laughs> and how ironic pretty much the exact opposites <laughs> but the word that I was thank you rocker G Walker and uh, Anthony excellent right I mean I think we could get through this and frankly speaking what happened in uh, Minnesota for the record is absolutely uh, uh, unconscionable it's uh uh, completely illegal act and these people should be put through the justice system and you know I know it's very slow and it's very painful but they have to go through the justice system like all of us and that's the right thing to do but what we really need is we just need some leadership we just need someone to step up who you know doesn't have a blemished record that has you know corrupt um, you know special interests controlling their strings from back end I don't know whether we have a world that has that kind of leadership. It's really sad, really. Anyway, that's uh, that's Brian's rant here. I apologize, everyone. But uh, if anything, um, you know, cur especially current level oneers, uh, you know, please don't be, uh, don't assume that what you're seeing here is, is this is the way capital markets work. That's just simply not the case. We are going through a very difficult transition period here. You know, generationally, it might take a few years for us to get to that other side when we can start thinking about growth. The interesting thing, though, is actually there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that is actually starting to show where that growth will be. And it really shouldn't surprise us that that growth, I think, is uh, going to be in our industry and this was one of the questions on that Q&A document that somebody just asked why do you think crypto uh, is going to do well in this coming growth cycle well look at that somebody already downvoted me so I must have said something that pissed somebody off um, so uh, this was a tweet actually uh, that was just shared in the lounge uh, this morning and I have to say this was uh, really it was actually quite eye-opening to me so you can see you know br brick and mortar uh, you know if you are an investor for the future I mean you really don't want to be in like there's no growth here and there won't be any growth for a while but where is the growth online electronics Jesus H Christ look at those numbers and uh, again sort of you know I mean grocery stores that's good you know I've got to buy your Campbell soup got to buy your Clorox you know those kind of things uh, I do I do find it interesting that we are hearing a lot of anecdote uh, anecdotal uh, information about the um, the um, 
home builders and like Lowe's and stuff, they actually have been seeing pretty good business through this. That surprised me, but you know, actually it does make sense. Um, and then, you know, online retail. <laughs> so anybody who is an online or of course is, uh, is enjoying the wind at their back. So, you know, this is a really, really good tell that really probably if you just sort of concentrate uh, your efforts on a few sectors uh, in the economy, uh, you probably can avoid a lot of this. And of course, in classic brick and mortar, this, I mean, it's almost like it's add insult to injury because, um, I mean, not only um, can, um, can, you know, companies like Amazon, you know, um, you know, through um, uh, economies of scale, uh, put you out of business just because they can operate at cheaper profit margins. Um, but also, too, you're getting now, and now, I mean, gee whiz, uh, if you were thinking about opening up a strip mall uh, operation in downtown Minneapolis, would that be a good idea? Um, so, I mean, it's almost like a, they're getting kicked in the nuts, too, from, like, multiple different directions. Um yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to see Monday morning. We should watch uh, companies like Arby's. Isn't Ar is Arby's a uh, publicly traded company? Because man, uh, they were lighting up Arby's right, left, and center. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, it'd be interesting if you actually put a list of all those. Uh, um, well, also too, tar weren't, weren't targets uh, getting hit too? And then what I'm worried about here from the stock market perspective is does it make sense that um, the stock market actually isn't cheap anymore? Stock market is actually pretty fairly valued. And if we look at something like uh, the stock market, you could, you could make the argument looking at the stock market, can I say stock market any more times? That really we're actually sitting exactly the same level we were uh, back in November. Um, all right, wow, there, there's a statement. Let's see if I can understand this. The Trotskyists hate all the global brands. Oh, wow, that's a statement. Okay. Um, and I suppose, you know, that's the irony of, uh, you know, the communist dream and Lenin, Lenin's dream and all that. They're going to now be, uh, like, whenever I was uh, debating uh, socialism with my brother or brother-in-law, who was like a just insane communist, like forever ago. Um, and I used to drive a lot. <laughs> uh, and um, he would say that uh, actually the true communist dream died the day that Trotsky was assassinated. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Maybe we're going to get a resurg resurgence of uh, Trotskyism. Who knows? Um, anyway, uh, back to our story. I mean, the irony of it all is I think you can make the argument the stock market is uh, you know pretty much back where we were sort of mid-November. Right? In mid-November... Um, Everybody's like, rah, 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 look at the bull ahead of us. So I think you can actually make the argument that the stock market isn't cheap anymore. Um, and, and you know, if somebody, uh, you know, came to me and said, well, Brian, how would you describe what just happened here? I would say, well, that's a dead cat bounce if I've ever seen one. It's a total classic. And uh, there was a gentleman, uh, Mr. Zell, I can't remember what his first name is, you know, Mr. Hedge Fund Manager, Wall Street Guru, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I thought he described actually this situation really well uh, with regard to things like stock valuations. And he simply said that um, you got a situation right now because interest rates are so low. Uh, I mean, it, it, if you are, um, you know, forced to constantly go to the bond market and, um, and get refinanced, that's a different conversation altogether. Uh, but, you know, things like um, people own their homes. And what are they doing? They're actually taking, like, reverse mortgages out on their homes. Well, you can't foreclose on a reverse mortgage. Um, so in that kind of situation, you know, mom and pop sitting at home, they own the home, right? And maybe they're just, you know, their monthly income is or some sort of reverse mortgage. Um, it would almost make sense, too, in that situation that we do negative interest rates so that they get screwed that way, too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's here and there. 
So, you know, you can think of the stock market the same sort of thing that, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that are long stock, but it's not like they're being foreclosed on. This was, uh, oh, we're shutting the economy down, right? So uh, all stores uh, closed, everybody go home. There wasn't any talk of, uh, you know, uh, mortgage foreclosures, banks, runs, that kind of stuff. Um, so sellers, in a weird sort of way, they're not really motivated to chase the market down. You know, the politicians, of course, they sold into the up market, and I suppose that's, you know, that makes sense. Uh, but, you know, when the market was dumping, they actually found that the market was, you know, it was kind of just like gapping lower and stuff, and it wasn't really finding a lot of sellers. And this Mr. Zell guy, he said, well, the reason why you're probably going to see the market bounce back up is we got a bit of a vacuum. Um, and in the absence of new fundamental drivers, that's where technical analysis works best. And, you know, in a vacuum, what's most likely to happen? Things like 50% uh, bounces. That That is a very natural thing to happen. Uh, and then if the rally continues on, this is where we get into conversations about reload zones, that ironically enough, it's only now um, that once we've actually gotten up into this zone, that if the bears really do believe this is a bear, that it's ironically enough only now that they actually go, okay, well, you know, we can actually start thinking about coming back in and defending the shorts that maybe we put on here to actually cause this meltdown. Uh, also too, you know, now we're getting into the point where price is getting up into the area where those sellers, maybe they did buy in here, they they start thinking, okay, well, you know, if I really do need the money, all right, fine, now I can sell. So um, really, you know, historically, if we look back over time, actually, I don't think this is really too out of the ordinary what's happened here. It's actually, you know, very stock markety. Um, so, you know, and I talk lots Monday to Friday about, uh, these fun little, um, oh, actually, you know what we should probably do? Let's, uh, let's jump into, um, uh, to the Q and A. Let's see if we can do the follow up there and just make sure those questions are all answered. So let's go copy and then we will go, how do I want to do this? I guess we can go here. Paste. Hope there's no dirty pictures here. Uh, what is this? Oh, that's interesting. That's not what I was expecting. That's why it's a good idea to uh, stock market after riot charts. Oh, cool. Yeah, we can look at that in a bit. I grabbed the wrong link. Let's try that again. Bang. BCS questions. All right. Oh, there's a few questions here. Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, our level oneers right now, uh, they're going through the wonderful process of learning, trying to learn the basics of, uh, fundamental analysis. Uh, <laughs> good luck. Eh? Um, and, um, this idea of value, um, What's the best way to show this to you, I wonder? We don't really have uh, the uh, the course material actually on its own Thinkific, isn't it? So I wonder what's the best way to show this. Hmm. Where have I put this on the site? Well, okay, uh, why don't we jump into the questions and then I'll um, I'll see if I can figure uh, a way to do this a little bit more efficiently for you. I realize that uh, you have to be on the Thinkific platform to go through this stuff, eh? Okay, let's see what we want to do here. Hold on a second. Uh, do, 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 and we want to, hmm. well, I think we'll just jump right in to, where is that page? 
Where is my fundamental screeners? All right. So uh, for U.S. listed companies, and yeah, let's see what we got here. I like to go to a site called Finviz. It's nice. I mean, uh, you can get this information on almost all of these websites. Uh, when are you going to do a coinage show? That would be cool, actually. You know, I hope they're doing okay, uh, Thrun. If, um, if you uh, want to suggest it to them that they reach out and uh, do one of these with me, I think that would be totally awesome. Um, okay, so to answer this question, the qu first question is, what is a share consolidation and why consolidation is positive for the investment decision? Uh, let's see the answer. I don't know if this is an answer that was put here. It is just a consolidation of a few shares in one and doesn't affect the price. Well, split is normally considered as positive thing as it makes stock more liquid. Brian in his lecture says consolidation is a positive signal and split is negative. I don't didn't manage to get why. All right. So uh, we have to understand that a consolidation of the, a company's stock or a rollback of the company's stock. In the United States, they call it a reverse split because they just don't like the PR about saying things like uh, consolidation, rollback, right? Because those are kind of negative connotations. So in the United States, they'll say uh, reverse stock split. Um, it is a sign of there's a problem internally in the company. Now, uh, we often see, you know, U.S. companies, these major exchanges, the uh, NYSE, the NASDAQ, the Amex, they'll have a minimum sh uh, share price requirements. Um, and quite often uh, what will end up happening is the actual value of the company, you know, like if I go like uh, IBM, we have to understand that there's two components that make up the value of a company. So uh, the first component that makes up the value of the company, of course, is what is the actual price of the unit trading in the marketplace. And what you've actually, you're all uh, in in the public, which is really sad, because the uh, the supply of money itself uh, was was for a very long time considered almost like sacred. You know, you didn't mess around with the supply of money because then your economy goes to all hell in a handbasket. Um, hint, hint, hint. They're messing around with the supply of money right now. Uh, so uh, you fill in the rest of that. Um, the second, like, so, and you see it says here market cap, right? So this is technically the value of the company in the open marketplace. It's the number of shares that the company has, you know, issued um, and the value of each share in the marketplace. And you multiply the two and it comes out to the market capitalization of a company like IBM. Um you know, uh, a company that uh, has this many shares outstanding, they're not likely to be able to go to Wall Street and get further financings from Wall Street because, you know, let, let's say they a issue uh, 80 million shares. I mean, you can imagine how much money that is. But that's really only financing like 10% of the company. So why would a financing firm go out, you know, for 10% stake in a company? I mean, the deal better be really juicy. So what often ends up happening is, I mean, let's say IBM's fortunes don't go so well. And I mean, hell, I can show you lots of charts. Here's a really good example of one that was uh, very expensive a while ago. And you know, we look at it, uh, you know, it's $20, $30 here back just back in 2018. Uh, I mean, it was $100 a share there back in, uh, you know, what is that, 2013, 2014. So this can happen to any company. And I can show you tons of charts that look like this. I mean, in fact, 
The irony of capitalism is you have to understand that this shares, this company shares, right? That's these things. They're, they're, they are basically the company's currency. So, you know, if I can go and do a financing, i.e. I will give you uh, X amount of shares, and in exchange you will give me these fiat dollars, in essence, that's the company exchanging part of itself in exchange for money. Um, it is the company's currency. Um, so, you know, the issue with companies like these, and, you know, this is where it gets kind of problematic. You know, a company like IBM, you don't have to worry too much because they are actually earning money. Right? And this is the key. You can have a fairly large market cap and a lot of shares outstanding as long as you are earning money, i.e. the company is actually getting more valuable. It, there's more money at the end of the day on the company's balance sheet um, than you had to pay out to, you know, at the start of the day, you know, i.e. a profit then it doesn't really matter how many shares are out. And this market cap can get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where do we have a trillion dollar company yet? As long as the company keeps earning money, yep, there you go, $1.1 trillion. As long as the company keeps earning money, and of course those earnings are growing, this number can go to the moon. And <laughs> I think that's the definition of moon right there. But understand that, you know, with 500 million shares outstanding, if this company doesn't earn money, and like I said, I can show you lots of growth stories. Uh, we could probably pull up charts of things like uh, pets.com and stuff, uh, you know, where they look like this DDD. Keep in mind, this DDD at one point was $100 a share way back when. So at one point, it was probably earning lots of money and, uh, you know, market cap was huge. Even now, I mean, gee whiz, the market cap's like a billion or better part of a billion dollars and they're not earning any money at all. I mean, what happens if they get to the point where they, you know, you can see they're, they've got uh, quite a bit of cash on the books. So they're okay there, right? You can see that. EPS uh, right now, I mean, they took a really big hit here recently, but it looks like the, the blood is letting. They probably wrote down some assets. Um, but what happens if they run out of this cash? What happens if this cash goes to zero? Um, you know, as long as you don't have any debt on the books, and this isn't terrible. I mean, this could turn into a problem if the equity just keeps going down. This number could get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they might really have a problem. Um, but what happens if the cash goes to zero? You know, like uh, a lot of these retailers right now. Uh, we played one, and you just have to understand what you're getting involved in here. E-X-P-S, uh, was it? Was it Express? What was the um, symbol on that thing? Uh, damn. Old man Idas here. Uh, somebody's uh, going to help me here. I don't even know. I haven't, don't even have the window up here because I've, uh, I've got the questions uh, in front of me here. So what did you guys say? Remember Express? That was a fun one. EXPR. That's what I thought. Well, that was close. Oh, thanks, man. There it is. I mean, this is you're playing with fire with some of these companies. It looks like they've uh, gotten rid of a lot of their debt, so that's good. And actually, this might be an interesting one because they did they roll the stock back? I can't remember. I know there's another one we're pl flirting with here. Uh, you know, these are brick and mortar retailers like this one here. Look at this debt to equity. Holy Jesus H Christ. So in this kind of case, I don't care how much cash you got on the books. Oh my goodness, that's that's bad. M, Macy's, what's Macy's? And the problem with these brick and mortar retailers is they have to carry inventory. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a general rule in our, um, in our TRI SOF club that we're not really allowed to look at companies that have better than a 0.5 debt to equity ratio, so that would just miss. 
uh, you can see that they can sell off some assets, but and this guy's got some cash, so I mean he can survive. But look at this, EPS next quarter is expected to be a loss of two dollars twenty-five cents, so they're gonna chomp through a lot of that cash, eh? Chomp, 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 chomp. Um, you know, J.C. Penny. I think this is a good example. I don't know if it's still on the on here or not. Is it gone? No. J.P. Morgan. <laughs> Did J.P. Morgan go and buy J.C. Penny? Anyway, I think they uh, listed on the uh, pink sheets. Uh, but you can see even Macy's right here's not a bad example. I mean, I don't know whether they survive or not. But uh, 300 million shares up. You know, so you know, in this kind of case. Wall Street's probably not going to be that interested in doing a financing for them. And what they'll probably say is, look, if you want to do a financing, you have to roll the stock back. You know, they roll it back like 10 for 1, consolidate, all that kind of talk. Uh, then there'll be like 30 million shares out, and the stock will be like $60 a share. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's value, but it, it is sort of the last final event that if they do that rollback, clean up this number, get it down into that 30 million area, then Wall Street starts getting interested. They love 30 million. And, it, you know, the CanSlim model developed by uh, William O'Neill, its criteria is we look for stocks between about 20 and 30 million shares up. You can find those stocks. They are absolutely the best. And actually, I remember AT&T, they restructured it. I don't know how many is out now. Seven billion. But when they did the restructuring of AT&T so many years ago, it doesn't even show on here, back uh, through the dot-com mess. When they did the restructuring, there was only two or three, uh, or 20 or 30 million shares out. So they've already gone and diluted the shit out of it already. Um, General Motors was another one where they rolled the stock back. You remember through 2008? Let's see. Look at that. So they restructured General Motors back in 2008 after the bankruptcy. 20, 30 million out. Look at They've already gone and diluted the shit out of it. So they've already issued 1.4 billion shares. It's remarkable. So um, the point being that if a company is not earning money and they're losing money, and they're running out of assets to sell. I mean, something like General Motors, they're trading at a little bit, um, just a little discount to book value. So, I mean, technically, if you add up all the desks, all the pencils, all the erasers, all the plants, all the tires that General Motors owns, it comes out to about 28 bucks. So from that perspective, you're just buying value here, right? Uh, if they liquidated all the assets of the company, uh, that's what shareholders would get. Actually, a little bit higher than what it is right now. The only problem is, look at this. I mean, what I just said there about companies I can invest in. Can I even consider investing in a company with that kind of debt? No. Um, so, you know, um, well, it's always a question about whether book value is included in the debt to equity. The point that I would just make is if I saw these two together, that to me is major problem. So what it means to me is uh, should interest rates actually change appreciably, this could get out of control. Does that make sense? So I just really want to avoid this kind of situation altogether. Just want to completely avoid it. So if I ever see a company that has like a debt to equity, you know, the interesting thing with a lot of our little companies that have jumped up here recently, the only reason why they have is because they have no debt, right? So they're not playing all this nonsense with, um, with, um, uh, central banks and lending and all that kind of stuff. If you don't have any debt, like a company like this, they're totally beholden on what the hell the bond market's going to do. If the bond market collapses, these guys are in big trouble. Um, so uh, there was a stock that I recently bought. It was a good example of one. What the heck was that? It was... Uh, let's see... I think I posted them in my little trading room on Rocket Chat. Where is that? Boom. 
Uh, oh, those are profit takes. Did I not post the buy? Um, eh, fudge. What was that little? Oh, yeah, it's over here. Uh, no, this is all crypto. And I don't know. I'm not. Um, I'm going to have dinner with Liam here tonight, so I'm not really in a big hurry. You guys up for a marathon session here? <laughs> <laughs> big groan oh jesus christ <laughs> six hour deal oh this is not a daily brief though this is chicken bark 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 i'm just having fun talking the shit you know just enjoying myself living a trader's life Woo party uh, okay where was that over here um do 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 where are you this cute little stock Tell you that much by crackers. Uh, those are all our crypto stocks. Man, they're looking heavy. Uh, do, 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 do. What was that little pharma one that I just bought? <laughs> That's always a good sign, eh? Not. Don't do what Donnie don't does. Uh, damn. uh no 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 well i i bought that one a while ago no it was just a cute little one down in the states you know the problem is is you can't do as strict a screening on the little ones down in the states that i like uh, i much prefer a much stricter screen but um it's a good example for this uh this call here just gotta remember what the hell the damn symbol is mm, idiot uh Uh, do, 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 do. Well, it'll probably come to me later. Uh, let's see. I'll just do a quick peruse and see if I can grab it. Kevin, you know what it is. I think it was your idea. And I got to tell you, man, these uh, these TRI people, and our little stock picking group, man, we have so much fun with these guys. Yeah, everything's jumping around all over the place. I don't know my screen here just... In fact, actually, I think I even did it for the public one. Oh, well. Now I'm just wasting everybody's time. That's too bad. Man, it would have made a nice story. What did I do with maybe one more attempt? Because I'm just a crazy, crazy. You cra Here it is. Yay, look at that. We found it. A-E-M-D. This is, this is a good example. So, uh, where should we do this? Where do I put that Finviz page? Do I have it here? Hmm, thought I had it around here. Finviz, where are you? There you are. Oh, uh, now you're going to hate me. What did I say the symbol was? A-E-M-D, right? I think that was one. Athlon Medical. So, here's a, I mean, this is an interesting situation, right? Um... There's only 2.8 million shares in the flow. So it's the exact opposite situation of all those really, really heavy companies. And what's really interesting about this is, you know, on the uh, NASDAQ, they have this sort of, you know, have to maintain a $1 listing or you get delisted. So you get a situation here where just to maintain that dollar listing, keep in mind, the day, like on a split adjusted basis, this is $500 a share. What? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but what they've had to do was as the markets come back down, they have to keep rolling the stock back and rolling the stock back and rolling the stock back. So, you know, this is a kind of situation where, uh, you know, we're sitting right at the bottom, and I think they just rolled the stock back recently. Um, it's, uh, it's you know, the market cap's only $15 million bucks. Uh They're losing money right now, but all it takes is for them to just sneeze. There's no stock out. Uh, and you could very easily pop this thing a buck or two. So, you know, half of the reason why I like to uh, buy these, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Half of the reason why I like to buy these low share counts is just simply think of this. If this stock starts moving up, who's going to be selling? There's no stock in the marketplace. There's only 2.8 million here. And gee whiz, the other day I traded like, I think like a million or two shares. 
So in essence, a whole bunch of the company just switch hands. If this thing actually starts getting going, are there any sell orders up here? Not really, because there's no stock. And remember, all the old shareholders, when they did roll it back, they all got destroyed. You know, maybe they had 10,000 shares when it was way back here, way up top. Now they've got like, you know, if they did 10 for one, 20 for one, they got like 40 shares, 400 shares. I mean, they just don't have enough to stop this thing. So what often happens in these low share count stories is if they actually get ahead of steam on them because there isn't that much stock out in the marketplace, they can just pop out of nowhere. And you get like a 50% appreciation in the company's value just like that. But does that, you know, the point here for us is, does it make sense? It's a lot easier to take a stock like this with a $14 market cap. Um, well, then it goes to lower board and your idea is toast. <laughs> Somebody asks, what happens if they don't meet the, meet the listing requirements? Rebonds. Thank you, Tim Draper. We all know that. And let's call a spade a spade. If you're playing the stock market and you're playing this game, you have to understand, I've said it repeatedly, you will never find a, a, a system, I don't care who you are, that's 100% guaranteed. And uh, what's really interesting about that story is basically everything was ready to go. It's just, I don't think the company did any business. Anyway, here nor there. Continuing this story, um, I've got actually a technical floor to work with here. Um, if we do break that level, well, then I, I suppose I can get out. This might rebonds you, and if that's the case, then uh, caveat emptor, you got to understand that is part of this game. Uh, don't put more than 5% of your stake in, at risk on any one single idea. And keep in mind that 5% is absolutely max limit. You want to go in on a name like this, 1%, 2% of your stake. And, you know, if you bang out a double, great, that 2% turns into 4%. And then that way, worst case scenario, if this thing goes right off the board, 2% turns into zero. It's a zero sum game. You want to shoot for two and a half. You want to shoot for uh, some bigger numbers here. See the gap. I remember I was joking on YouTube that there's gaps on this silly thing up at 20 bucks. I see a gap right there at $10. Maybe that's the approach you take. Uh, I'm going to little old lady this kind of thing. I'll put 2% in at 147. Uh, maybe I'll sell half on a double and then that way I don't have to worry about it. But ultimately I'm looking for like this $10 up here. I don't know. That's up to you. And understand, nothing's guaranteed in this business, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. point I'm trying to make here is, does it make sense, right? And you need to sort of clue into this. How much money is it actually going to take for this stock to go from $1.47 to, say, $3, or basically doubling in value? What does that mean, like, in raw dollar terms? What it means is that the market cap is going to go from 14.7 million to what, about 30 million. Is that a lot of money? Would it take a lot of buying power to do that? Probably not. But remember, we're traders, right? I'm going to take, like, let's say I'm working with, I don't know, uh, 20 grand. So I'm going to take, um, in this case, I would feel comfortable taking, uh, say, uh, 1,400 bucks and racing to a break of this low, right? And uh, in that kind of scenario, I could risk, you know, even up to 50% of that stake and it wouldn't be breaking that 5% rule. So um, I've went and bought, uh, what, a uh, thousand shares, $1,470. If this thing goes to $3, well, my $1,400 investment is worth $3,000 to me. Doesn't make a difference but hopefully you can see it's probably a hell of a lot easier for this thing to go from $1.47 to 3 than it is for something like IBM, for example. For it to double, if you bought it at $124, i.e. it goes up to $250, bucks, it means the company IBM goes from a market cap of $110 billion to $240 billion. That's a hell of a lot of money. 
So hopefully that helps you also to understand. And, you know, in, in very real terms, um, low share count stocks, uh, they're a lot of fun because when the sort of the guys that are running the show, right, the VCIM model works very simply. It says um, we're going to find an old, dead, defunct company, right? So I think this uh, recent one was a great example. And a cool thing is, is this is in uh, crypto as well. So it's like right down all of your rally. It's uh, absolutely perfectly applicable. Um, they call it uh, Blockchain 2 Corp. Oh, there's a fancy name. Um, this one, in essence, uh, yeah, in the stock market, and it doesn't matter whether it's Blockchain 2 Corp or whether it's uh, IBM or that 3D systems that I showed you earlier or that little pharmaceutical stock. To have a publicly traded listed vehicle, remember, this is in essence a currency, right? And think of it kind of like your blockchain, your cryptocurrency. I mean, it takes a lot of work to bring them to life. I mean, during the ridiculousness there, it was almost a joke. But nonetheless, uh, to actually have a publicly traded senior exchange listed issue, there is a lot of legalese involved. Um so, you know, and of course, lawyers don't come cheap. And of course, there's filing fees and the regulators, of course, they want their cut. And then, you know, um, um, anyway, so the point being that a publicly listed trading vehicle in itself, regardless of whether the company is of any value or not, the vehicle itself is actually very valuable. Uh, and when I used to do deals in the venture exchange, um, the shell alone of a dead, defunct, out-of-business company could be worth at that point, and this is, uh, geez, I left the business in 2006, 2007. Um, so at that point, one of these venture exchange listed, senior listed shells, it was worth about a quarter of a million to half a million dollars. So, and I would imagine in today's dollars, it's probably like five to 10 times that price. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, so that's, that's a really important thing for people to understand. And that's really the premise behind VCIM is not so much you're buying the story, I'm buying a gold mine, I'm buying a, uh, in this case, a cryptocurrency company. Think of VCIM as you are buying a sound structural idea. So what do we mean by structural? Um, really good example, we'll come back to this in a bit, but there's a really good example one a couple of years ago, and I love talking about it. I think I've mentioned this on the uh, free videos. I know I mentioned it in class with students and stuff. But this is a really good example. Back in 2016, we were doing our VCIM models, and this was a company called Red Hat uh, Resources, or Red Hill Resources, beg your pardon, Red Hill Resources, RDR or something like that. On the venture exchange, uh, you know, this is... Uh, um, it is 1999. I mean, that's how old this is, right? Um, so um, just even in here, you can see it was defunct, right? Geez, that's the dot-com boom there. Uh, here is the, uh, I suppose it just, it stayed halted there. Uh, looks like it came back in 2011. So this must have been when Red Hat, sort of Red Hill, um, got the shell. They did a whole bunch of financings. They were in the mining business. Terrible time to be in the gold mining business through this. And they just simply ran out of money. They just kept doing financings after financings after financings. Their share count got so high. You know, think of IBM, you know, 800 million shares. Out. And there's lots of these venture companies with hundreds of millions of shares out. Keep in mind, and this is also something that I don't think you guys are getting, uh, level oneers. 
90%, if not 95% of all, probably 99% of all venture cap ideas that you will look at will have shitty balance sheets. And anything you hear touted on social media or, you know, like, uh, you know, stock uh, bulletin board trading penny stocks, I almost guarantee you 99% of those things are going to look like shit if you actually look at the actual structure of the company. So what we're doing here with VCIM is we're looking for the structure. That's the screen is what does a good structure look like? So, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of shares out, the company's defunct, it's run out of financing ability, it's dead. But the shell is still worth something. That's what you have to understand. This is a trading vehicle. It can stay halted, but it's still a vehicle. You know, just having a publicly uh, listed company, I mean, the process of us just setting up a private company in Canada uh, is a pain in the butt. Public company? Oh, boy. So, new venture capitalists come along when the stock's dead and there's a hundred bazillion shares out and there's you know it's bid a penny offered a penny and a half and there's just nothing happened and they say look at we really want this shell because we think that we have an idea that we want to do new management will come in and they will basically vote at shareholder meeting to roll the stock back, i.e. consolidate the shares. And the good part about it, although I can never get it to work when I want to, <laughs> it drives you crazy. Let's see if there's any of these things that'll show us. Um, sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. There's an E there, so maybe it'll show. Here's our beloved rebounds, right? So we came in off of the bottom end of the range, that whole conversation, and Mr. Draper fucked us. He made an active decision that he did not like uh, the public participating in his company, and he voluntarily delisted his company from the exchange, which is interesting, too. Because it's not like uh, the, the exchange actually kicked him off. He could have very easily, they gave him lots of time to sort of bring the company back in line. But he consciously decided to delist his company. So keep in mind, that's capitalism 101. There will be Tim Drapers out there. And the cool part about it, this is exactly like, um, uh, what was that dickhead who was uh, in charge of uh, Nautilus Coin? What was his name? He's actually got a job on a fucking major U.S. media station. And yet he is basically, a, in my eyes, he is a criminal. He's a basically committed fraud with that Nautilus coin. Uh, what was his name? Yeah, Kelly. Something Kelly. Um, and, and that's so sad because these people never get held to account. Yeah, everybody should say his name. I mean, please, Mr. Kelly, where are our Nautilus coins? Why, why are you not held to account over that? You know, that's capitalism. Mr. Draper? You know, what are you doing here? I'm a shareholder. You fucked me over. What are you doing? <laughs> Welcome to capitalism. Uh, you know, should we bet the farm on any one idea in capitalism, people? <laughs> I mean, you know how this goes. We want to play from a position of strength. If I went and bet the farm on Brian Kelly, or I went and bet the farm on Tim Draper, would that have been a good idea? Hmm. Anyway, I mean, it's capitalism. If if you cannot accept that this it could potentially happen to you, then you have no business playing in this game, and you haven't set up your plan correctly to be able to address that this actually does happen all the time in capitalism. Thank you, Mr. Draper. Uh, all right. Um, where were we? Actually, yeah, here. So you can actually see it on sites like TradingView. They will actually show you um uh when the stocks are actually uh, consolidated and actually this was one of the reasons why we were very interested in mr uh, rebonds and mr draper was he did actually take a shell that was basically worthless rolled it back he played his monkey games with the stock though and then ultimately screwed over shareholders in the end so I understand it does happen in this game uh but i wanted to show you uh Let's see if it'll show here. Maybe it will if we're lucky. 
do 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 do. There we are. Yay. So we were interested. Is this? Yeah. Um, I think it's in here somewhere. Uh, maybe it was in here. Might have been in here. I seem to remember it was out about a dime. But the key here is you want, number one, you want news that the stock's been rolled back. So already that's going to get our attention. Then we want to actually see that the rolled back stock actually has some value. So how do we determine that? Um, two metrics that I think are extremely valuable. Actually, I think the rollback, there it was there. That's what we're looking for. Um, two metrics that I think are extremely valuable are when companies uh, relinquish debt that's owed to them, uh, or excuse me, owed by them, uh, for stock in the new company. Um, and actually on the um, on this site, there's I have another example in the library. And actually, we also, and I was posting this in the, um, geez, I'm all over the place here. Anyway, here is the um, the example in the library. This is one that I traded a few years ago. It didn't really do a hell of a lot, but we did get a nice little rally out of it and made some good money. But in essence, they rolled the stock back here. Boom. So in essence, I think this was a 10 for one or 20 for one. Um, so the stock instantly gets repriced uh, higher. Right, because it's in essence, it's the same price as uh, the market cap of the company shouldn't change on the rollback date. So, in essence, maybe there's a hundred million out here. They roll back for ten for one, so the price is ten times higher. There's only ten million shares out now, or what I say, ten for one rollback, something like that. Stock peters around, and what we want to hear through this event is we want to hear that options to directors and shares for debt were announced. In essence, that happens. Market comes down, fills in the gap from the uh, from the rollback event, and now at this point, this is insane value. And in essence, you can see somebody came in on the buy side quite hard right at that level, and she didn't look back. So we see this repeatedly. Um, I think I was showing you earlier, you know, this ML, it followed exactly the same logic. They rolled the shares back, options for debt, shares for directors, stock went nuts. Um, we had uh, just even this one just happened. It literally just happened in front of us. Uh, and really, you know, it would be good if I just mapped out exactly the events step by step by step. This one happened a couple of years ago. And I did a write-up on the site. I suppose we could probably go back somewhere on the site. Uh, we used to, you know what's weird is we used to post like all the banging out doubles, every single thing on the site. And then when we went moved to this new site, all that functionality has stopped. So I, it's very difficult for me to uh, find uh, and post uh, the trades and keep track of them uh, as well as I used to. Hopefully we can get over that hurdle a little bit better now. Uh, but in essence, uh, this was another one of these uh, old stock uh, out of business. They rolled the stock back, big jump up, uh, shares for debt, options to directors. So do your research window through uh, basically the end of 2018. This is where they did all the restructuring. Um, and then on that gapping event, I went in and bought. Now, this is a really good example of, you know, everybody in the level... Um, one uh, program right now you're understanding fundamental analysis and this is like Warren Buffett Charlie Munger that kind of stuff where you're just gonna go in and just buy value um, you're not even really gonna think about it it's just like fundamental analysis 101 this is the way fundamentalists invest and you can see for a while there, it's like, gee whiz, Brian, why, you know, uh, why am I subscribing to your newsletter? All right, well, maybe actually I'll uh, renew your new newsletter. Maybe you're not so bad. And then, oh, no, you're an idiot again. Why did I bother, right? Okay, well, you know, maybe you're back out of the doghouse. Well, you know, we really haven't done much, Brian. Um, you know, I don't know why I still listen to you, you know, uh, uh, 
okay, fine. Maybe you're getting... Oh, whoa, 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 what the fuck? <laughs> that, is, that, ironically enough, that's actually exactly how capitalism works. Is uh, you spend most of your time in capitalism, and all of you in crypto, you've been through this over the past couple of years. You spend most of your time in capitalism going through this, oh, boring, boring, boring. And then the... You know, go from uh, you basically your buy level to banging out doubles in like a heartbeat. And this is one of the reasons why you have to work open orders. You have to be on the ball because you can see it. If you didn't sell into this rally, the rally's disappearing a little bit. Uh, I do find it fascinating. You know, I just uh, I have a general rule that uh, I sell half on a double. It's just what I do. It's my bread and butter, blah, blah, blah. So I happen to have the order working here, and gee whiz, I got filled here. Turns out, actually, a yeah, very typical 50% retracement. It could have gone all the way up here, but look at the gap all the way here. This is all a gap. So I don't know what the hell these guys are going to do, but this is a really good example. Uh, and I used to know lots and lots of guys in the brokerage business that basically this is what they did. This was their business. This is a hell of an edge. Um you're not going to be banging out doubles every single day, but when your uh, idea goes, it can go. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is, gee whiz, is there any room if this thing actually gets its act together? Is there any room for this thing to move up here? I think there is. I mean, aside with all the text and stuff, you can see. I mean, gee whiz, that's, is that a gap all the way up top there? No, that's not a gap. But Oh, yeah, there's a little bit of a gap way up there. And, you know, you look at that and you go, well, Brian, I don't think, you know, that's crazy talk, I kind of think. But, you know, I mean, I had one uh, just last year. I couldn't believe how far it went. I was actually very surprised. Um, and they were in, like, the cement business. <laughs> I mean, of all things. I thought, uh, these guys, they're, they're in the quarry business. And you just never know how far these silly things are going to run. All the criteria lined up through here. And it just, you know, the irony of it all is that's what, from like 10 cents or whatever. And it got all the way up to, I guess, about 60 cents there last year. So, I mean, you never know what's going to happen. You know, I think I got two doubles off on this one. So I felt pretty good about that. Um, and there are a lot of guys in the uh, in the brokerage business that they just this is this is basically their oh this is the U.S. one that's why <laughs> I was like what the heck's going on here? Of course I traded my uh, and you know it's kind of funny. Um, one of the uh, richest guys in um, in the in Canada he has um, uh, Athabasca Minerals and there's so many here. Oh, why can't I find this? Anyway, it doesn't matter. You get the idea. Um, so for level oneers, what I really want you thinking about with VCIM, and um, there's one actually that I was touting here recently, so go do some research on this one. It's happening as we speak. Um, I even uh, give the specific dates, uh, and I thought I posted on the site um, the actual links. You can see... And again, like it's so frustrating. Why? Why is this not showing here? Um, I don't know. Damn it. Um, I would like to show you that event. It should have a little S right over there. I don't know how to do this. I'm an idiot. Um, they did shares for debt. They did options to directors. So they really cleaned this thing up nicely. Uh, they brought it right back down into the uh, lows, putting in some half-decent structure. I'm more than happy to just go buy some of this. Um, and you tell me, has this got any room to run up? And the most important thing for this model is just simply um, it's structurally sound. You know, they happen to be in, I don't know, genomics business, so like pharma of some sort. You know, there's another one, J-U-G-R, same thing. Go and do the research, right, as half of your education is understand why would Brian be interested in this. Roll stock back, uh, shares for debt, options to directors, you tell me. Does this thing have any room to run up here? Uh, they're in my settings. How the hell do I get the settings? Do I push this? Settings, here we go. Nothing. 
sometimes uh, sometimes I have to refresh this page. So uh, I showed you two examples from the past. You can see I'm very active in this one. Um, and two examples that are happening as we speak. And the interesting thing about this is I don't really have any deadline or, you know, this has to perform by next week. Uh, the events thing in here, it's somewhere in here, isn't it? Look at all these fun symbol name, status symbol, maybe here, colors, extended hours. So many settings, right? Uh, events, maybe there. Hey, here we go. Mm, splits. Hey, there we go. Perfect. Look at that. Nailed it. So you can see that this guy's uh, basically already starting the criteria. So, uh, you know, you level oneers, if you are jazzed about uh, learning more about uh, fundamental analysis screens. And really, uh, what I would suggest to all of you is, you know, get off your butts. Uh, I've given you two names here. Um, call the companies. Why don't you get to know what's what's happening inside the companies? Build a rapport. I mean, if you're investing your hard-earned money in these companies, why don't you get to know the investor relations department? You 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 might you know the interesting thing is if you start saying that you're a prospective shareholder or you are a shareholder, you'd be surprised how they treat you. Uh, it was interesting we were having this conversation at level oneers. Where, you know, and this is weird. It's like this is the way capitalism works. Um, really, I think capitalism at the end of the day is all about relationships. And it's all about people, right? And shaking a hand. Can you trust the person on the other side of the deal? Um, and um, ironically enough, you know, the this information age and this uh, this interesting transition of this social media where it's not one-on-one -on -one tra trans or, uh, interactions anymore it's these sort of like herd if anything social media is really reinforcing this herd mentality that of course as professionals in the marketplace we hate and ironically enough if it's reinforcing them then what that means is we as professionals, we're going to get more opportunities and the opportunities should be bigger and the volatility should be wider as more of these cattle keep moving and get moved in different directions. I hope you all can see that. You know, ironically enough, what's, you know, try to, if anything, try to use social media and the herd and, I mean, hell, just look out your window, you can see what's happening with the herd right now. Um, try to uh, build personal relationships through this. Because it will be the personal relationships that will get, get us through this in the end. Um, and uh, one great way, you know, if you are a prospective shareholder, to really make a personal contact with companies is to really reach out to them, get to know them. You know, the person that works at the IR department, they are a human. Get to know them by a first name basis. And I was really impressed, uh, one of the guys that I work with here in Vancouver, the guy is really, really smart. And, um, you know, he has a certain vocation that uh, he, uh, he likes to uh, partake in. And uh, he was like, uh, well, you know, I um, first the first day uh, I go in and I uh, I just get to know the person. Don't even really want to buy anything. Don't want to do any business. I, I just try to get to know the, the person that's working at the uh, cash register. So that way, you know, if he does do more business down the road, he's built a rapport with them. And it, you know, same thing works in the stock market and with these companies. There's there's no difference. So uh, they might be able to tell you, especially if you're interested in a company, they might be able to tell you about non-brokered deals that have absolutely nothing to do with the brokerage business. You buy the stock directly from the company. So, um, you know, that's also my challenge to you uh, students is, you know, we look at a lot of these names and stuff like that, and we don't actually realize that there are people behind these companies. So, 
you know, yes, we've given you the screen criteria. The great part about it is these are, you know, if you can follow VCIM logic, what you're doing is you're identifying structurally sound names, and then you can go start doing your, okay, well, you know, let's go kick the tires. Let's see what the hell they're up to. What, what are these guys like? And if they're assholes, well, you're like, okay, fine. I'm not going to invest my money with them. If their idea resonates with you and you're kind of like, you know what, I, I could really get into this. At least you're focusing in on good names to be focusing in on. Like I said, most people in the stock market, they they might be interacting with people that are good people. Think of like Enron that totally believe in the company, but they don't realize that the structure of the company itself is flawed. That That's really what this fundamental analysis conversation is all about. And if we want to talk about investing in something like a commodity, like, like Bitcoin, um, they're, because they're not earnings engines, right? And Bitcoin doesn't give a shit about earnings. Um, we can't really use those same metrics. Um, but at the same time, too, you know, if we hear that insiders are buying a lot of Bitcoins, well, that, that's probably good information for us to know. Um, and, you know, really when it comes to commodities in particular, what we really want to cost, uh, concentrate on is what is the actual cost to produce these? Because if the, if the price you're paying for a commodity in the marketplace is really detached, from the actual cost of what it costs to produce the commodity, what's the best thing to do? I'd be just curious. I mean, let's say it costs you a thousand bucks to mine Bitcoin and you pull up a stamp and the last price traded on Bitcoin is $150,000 a coin. What would be a good business practice at that point? anyone i mean just think about it the whole the whole adage right what's the cure for high commodity prices does anybody know i don't know am i just i'm probably just blabbing to myself eh? yeah but let's think i, I mean shark or shark <laughs> josh you're a shark so i mean uh that doesn't surprise me you're gonna say that right and then you're gonna say like and feast off the tears of the children right <laughs> Uh, but with a British accent, so you'll do it. You'll say it politely. <laughs> well, how about if if it costs me a thousand bucks to go out and mine a Bitcoin, and the stuff and it's trading at a hundred thousand plus dollars in the marketplace, why don't I go out and fucking mine some Bitcoins? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, duh. I mean, hopefully, that's pretty simple. So hopefully you can understand the logic of why uh, $20,000 Bitcoin just simply wasn't sustainable. Does, does that make sense? I mean, from a very simplistic point of view. You know, why, why couldn't Bitcoin stay up top there at $20,000 a coin? Where are we here? I mean, number one, we should all look at this chart, right, and go, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> straight line up, uh, probably problems. Uh, but if you just think about it in just simplest terms, again, I really want to sort of frame this conversation for the level oneers here. We went through sort of what are some matrix to try and figure out structurally sound ideas. I mean, you could argue the same logic of VCIM, rolled back stock, can slim, 20 to million 20 to 30 million shares out same logic as to why bitcoin's still attractive how many coins are outstanding right now on bitcoin all right all of you uh thank you all of you level one or should go ah oh, i see the connection that is not a coincidence and then uh, what has been the value of coins that have a bazillion, gazillion, jazillion, whatever, dadillion coins out? What happens to them? You know, like uh, good old Verge. How many coins are out on Verge? Isn't there like 100 bazillion, gazillion? I think there's a hell of a lot. I could be mistaken. Um, I 
do something like that. Link USD has 300 million. Well, I suppose 300 million is not terrible. And especially when they get up into the billions, it's just like, hi, 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 hi. Um, so, um, hopefully you see the difference between, you know, first and foremost, you know, if you ever see an asset that goes straight up like this, you have to understand this is a, you know, the market going parabolic and it's not sustainable. And the sad part about it is usually what goes up uh, must come down. Uh, it's a tragic part of capitalism. It's just the way that it goes. But uh, if we just go back to, uh, a Bitcoin, you know, it hasn't gone off the board, still hanging in here. And I think the number one selling feature is the low supply of coins out. So uh, I might argue that just like we were looking at that juggernaut and just like we were looking at that Tello, and if you were looking at that AEM a year or two ago, or you were looking at that uh, Millennium Lithium uh, a couple of, a few years ago now, structurally sound levels are a good place for people to invest their money. Uh, we already know that the count is structurally sound. Uh, I think really, you know, our value proposition here is what does it cost to keep the network going? Simple as that. The interesting thing you have to understand is commodities that are relatively well received, they don't trade at cost of production or below the cost of production for very long. That's an incredibly um, fortuitous buying opportunity window. So I don't think it's going to be like, you know, Bitcoin's going to give us all the, hey, here I am, I'm sitting at the cost of production, I'm just going to park myself here for the next little while so everybody can get the opportunity to buy as much as it possibly can right at the level that this thing's worth. It doesn't work that way. That's not how capitalism works, right? We all have to understand that. And usually commodities trade at a premium to the cost of production because you got to give the miners, the people that keep the network going you got to give them some sort of profit margin so um if you can buy bitcoin at or below the cost of production then really i think that's that's a bonus it but just like i showed you with the um with the uh that bitk for example you know if you are going to just simply end the conversation at fundamental value Think Warren Buffett, think Charlie Munger. Uh, you might be sitting on an asset that might actually trade even lower than where you bought it for a while. That happens. Um, and like that BITK, you have to be sharp. And when the asset gives you the opportunity to establish that risk-free position, you got to take it. So... I, I really don't mind the idea of people just simply, um, especially with this, uh, you know, tragically, I think I started off this conversation today by saying that I had joked musingly with the audience back in like 2013, 2014, when we first started, uh, and I really sort of put together this, you know, this fear greed cycle uh, thesis uh, together I had joked uh, but with some seriousness because I lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, months before the collapse of the Soviet Union it was business as usual Gorbachev was running around just doing his thing um, the Cold War was very much on um, and I mean, I suppose at that point, the writing on the wall, Soviet Union was uh, running out of money. Uh, gee whiz, that kind of sounds familiar. Um, and literally, within a snap of the fingers, it was gone. And the tell will be if we see the military start to sort of... Uh, not take orders from the top. If uh, if that happens, then uh, this could dissolve very quickly, which is such a shame. 
But I'll tell you, like I lived through the Soviet Union and, and I remember I've told you guys in the public this before, not a single predictor uh, predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union, all the fortune tellers, all that stuff, not a single one. And when it happened, it was like instantaneous and there was no going back. It was just like it was done, it was over, and that was it. And the Soviet Union and all its uh, satellite states and stuff like that, they went through a few years of a pretty tough slog. So, uh, you know, I had started off this conversation with, I don't think it's in anybody's best interest to have just a complete love affair in any one asset. <laughs> I think the best way to get through life is to have a nice diversified basket of assets. Um, that includes, you know, especially for you, you, you U.S. citizens, uh, maybe keeping a little bit in good old gold, a little bit in Bitcoin, a little bit in euros, a little bit in yen, you know, just to keep your ass covered. Uh, I don't know how this is going to play out here, but uh, this sure is dangerous. There's no doubt about that. Um. You know, a lot of talk today has been very rhetorical and sort of speaking to the uh, crypto audience, you know, just to, or, uh, to the, excuse me, to the level one audience uh, about share structures. Uh, I hope that helps you guys. Um, that was the whole purpose of this. I hope I didn't make it worse. Um, how are we doing on those questions? Uh, where did I put that? Over here? Nope. Over here. Oh, here we are. Um, okay, given the expected 51.2% GDP projected by the FRB Atlanta for the second quarter, the huge amount of increased debt in the balance sheet and the different events that we have experienced this 2020, COVID, riots, etc., the generational change, what do you think could be brewing and how can we protect ourselves or take advantage? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a damn good question. Um, I would have actually given you an absolutely perfect answer. You would have been like, oh, Brian, that's perfect. I'll go and buy this. I'll go and buy that. And I'm totally made in the shade. But unfortunately, I broke my crystal ball last week. So, um, and man, it was a really cool crystal ball, too. It could tell me everything. It literally, uh, no, okay, I won't be stupid. Um, I mean, I, hopefully, actually, I just spent the past hour kind of answering that question. <laughs> you know, your absolute best thing to do, I think, in this kind of environment is just be diversified. Don't don't hold all of, too much of any one thing. Um, and uh, ironically enough, if you actually had um, if you had equal amount of bonds and equal amount of stocks, uh, you know, level oneers, you'll be doing something called the efficient frontier in a couple of weeks to understand how portfolio managers uh, manage uh, risk. Um, there will be assets that will go up in value and there will be assets that go down. Uh, considering the very uh, articulate um, event window of this year. Problem is, I just don't know what the events are. But we definitely know, of course, uh, early April, and that was COVID. I'm getting the distinct impression that uh, end of June, early July could actually be uh, more sort of civil unrest, maybe martial law kind of environment. Uh, and then the worst part about this is the actual big one, the one that actually is the most important this year, I think, is actually in November. Um, so, you know, you, uh, you know, my basic message, and ironically enough, it, you know, it was another COVID um, experience. It wasn't COVID, obviously, Spanish flu. But I actually expect the... Uh, the markets in general, I mean, you never know exactly what the specific numbers are. But I actually expect the markets, like the stock market, if you will, as a function, basically a reflection of the economy, um, I expect it to uh, go through uh, basically this. So you can see this is uh, 1917 all the way to 1928. And it was it was just like a roller coaster. Up, hey, we're a bull. No, we're a bear. Oh, we're a bull. No, we're a bear. Oh, we're a bull. 
And the irony of it all is probably at the end of all of it, basically a market's exactly where it started. I don't know how deep we have to go. Do we have to go and take out these lows here? I mean, it wouldn't shock me. But in essence, we're like up and down and up and down. And obviously, we're going through or up here. I definitely think there needs to be some sort of down. This is just till the end of the year. I mean, does this look like zing, zing, zing? I don't know. My hunch is there will be some sort of panic event here into that November, December event. That's really what I'm expecting. But, you know, like I said, I don't have a crystal ball. Had one. Don't have one now. So, you know, if you're asking me what I'm expecting, that's what I'm expecting. Is that going to happen? Who fucking knows? Um, and then conversely, you know, these old highs up here, that high, that high, that high. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, resistance is right up in here, especially with this wick right here. There's a whole bunch of trap bulls in that wick that would love to get out. I don't know whether we can get all the way back up top here just yet, but we'll see. So, I mean, you're asking me what to expect for the coming year. Well, this is this is what I'm expecting. Um, you know, if if it was just something like I could just uh, go and take my money out of the bank and put it in a mattress and bury it and be assured that uh, everything will be tunky, you know, tickety boo by the end of all this, I, I would say probably do it. The only problem is I, I don't know what money itself is going to do through this. So that's why I said, you know, if you're diver diversified, at least, you know, it'll it, the, the waves will go up and down. And we might find a currency goes down here. Uh, we might find that the whole fiat system disconnects here. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, if you own a bit of Bitcoin, you own a bit of gold, right? If if that does happen, then, then you're probably insured. Um, ironically enough, actually, I'm more uh, enamored with silver right now than I am with gold. But... Um, I, me personally, for whatever it's worth, I don't see the uh, the banks right now. I think want to keep the system going. If the if the banks wanted to break things, they would have squeezed the market here credit wise, and we w the whole thing would have collapsed. So I get the distinct impression that this is going to be a long, slow, drawn out. Uh, process uh, unfortunately and you can see it in what's happening in the United States of America um, interestingly because they are as free as they are you actually get these expressions that are really exas exaggerated I don't know whether that's the right word or not so in a weird sort of way, um, and it's sad because I think what's going to happen now is the American population is going to take advantage and abuse their freedoms. Uh, we already saw one person in Dallas, a um, very, very bad, bad situation. So you can already, and I was posting out tweets and stuff, you can see that the crooks are coming in and they're looting stores and stuff. And they don't really give a shit about the guy who got killed. They're just in it for the petty crime. Um, and like I said, and what happened in Dallas is just horrific. So uh, unfortunately, what I see happening here is this is just going to reinforce um, the call for law and order, uh, a.k.a. it feels to me like we're heading towards a, a police state. I don't know how bad things are going to get, but um, uh, we just have our job is to just make damn sure to make sure you get through this year. So with all that said, happy, happy, joy, joy. Let's pop on over to crypto and just do a couple minutes there. Uh, give you an idea of what I'm sort of seeing there. And, you know, the irony of all of this is that this, you know, this is why I haven't spent a lot of time on these uh, broiler chickens and the daily brief recaps and even the daily brief for that matter talking Bitcoin because I don't see a whole lot going on here. It's not like somebody can go, oh, yeah, look at the setups. Oh, they're running. I mean, this this market, in my opinion, has been really hurry up and do nothing for an old slowpoke like me for a while. So, 
you know, I just want to start off this idea that uh, I, I hope you don't feel like it's your short change. And if anything, all you level oneers, this is perfect time for you to get that eating your vegetables crap out of the way so that when the market does get hot, right, at least you can focus in on price action and be hunting setups. Paper trading still now, please. Remember how many paper trades Graham wants you to do. So if anything, this is perfect that the market is actually pretty quiet right now in Bitcoin. Uh, so you're not distracted um, while you learn. Um, I mean, I, I can say the same message as I've said probably for the past month or two. Jeez, and how long has this been? I mean, it's been been sort of started to paint these kind of images back here. I remember I uh, went and found the 2016 price action, was overlaying it. I was thinking that the uh, pre happening uh, rally was actually going to come a little bit earlier. It actually came uh, a lot closer to the actual happening event itself <coughs> than I was expecting. Uh, but as this uh, sort of price action uh, from the 2016 happening event sort of suggested, uh, you know, the happening event for 2016 was somewhere right in here. Uh, we did have the, the pre happening pump uh, as sort of anticipated. And this final move up top here, there to there, created divergences. So we had a nice little inside bar failure up top there. And interesting how that was right on the underside of this trend line. So uh, we did have the dump pre happening It's interesting how the n numbers here weren't nearly as big uh, as they were through this. Like on a percentage basis, these dumps were much more personified. Um, which in itself, I think, is also, too, a commentary about Bitcoin sort of growing up. Um, you know, with the introduction of derivatives products um, and... Um, you know, if anything, I should, uh, I don't know, everybody give uh, Julian a uh, pat on the back. I kind of barked at him this morning for calling those Binance forwards products, futures products. Poor guy. Uh, didn't really mean to bark at him. So if you're watching this later, Julian, my apologies. But it's one of these pet peeves. Like, you know, keep in mind, I was a futures broker. So it's a pet peeve of mine how people in crypto are calling, you know, Binance futures and OKCoin OK futures when they're not. But anyway, uh, here nor there, the introduction of um, exchange cleared derivatives products, i.e. futures, um, and then uh, more esoteric products, things like options, um, in my opinion, that in itself is, number one, it's a sign of maturity of, of uh, the space. But also, too, you have to understand that you're probably going to see a lot of the, you know, insane volatility come out of price uh, because uh, of the derivatives markets. Right? There's more people buying calls. There's more people buying puts. And uh, we actually had a really, really good demonstration by one of our site OGs who was following the Deribit options. And he noticed that just a ton of uh, 12,000 calls were being written. And at the same time, I think it was the 4,000 puts. Was it the 4,000s or the 7,000s? So it looked like somebody was doing just a massive... Um, I don't know whether it was... Uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, option strategy just off the top of my head, but it looked like just a massive spread. Basically bracketing the market, 12,000 was your upside. Uh, I think it was 4,000, but it might have been 7,000 was your downside. Um, yeah, no, it's not a straddle, right? Because a straddle would imply the same strike. Question is, is it a strangle? But I think that there were different legs that they were doing on both sides. And I think that they were actually buying and selling the underlying relative to the premiums that they were collecting on them. Point here was that one of our site OGs noticed that somebody just kept banging out, just writing just a ton of the 12,000 calls. Uh, and at the same time was uh, banging out just a ton of, I think it was the 4,000 puts, but I can't remember. So what we have to understand is with the development of this space, you're going to see the crazy and nutso and sano volatility that we've seen in the years gone by probably come out. 
Having said that, that doesn't mean that there isn't lots of volatility. I mean, gee whiz, this uh, price movement here, that's uh, what, a partially uh, partial, or excuse me, uh, a, pa a paltry, let's see if I can say that 10 times fast, uh, what, $300, $250, $260. So, you know, if you are trading off of hourly charts, I think there's enough money to be made. But I just don't know whether you're going to see like 20% swings in a day anymore. Anyway, uh, only time will to hell. <clears throat> Point here is that um, this has been sort of framing my expectations on how the halvening event would play out and more importantly, what to expect following the halvening event. I think what ends up happening here is hopefully you can all see that this is really nothing more than just a massive uh, triangle consolidation, eh? something along those lines. So you can definitely see we're coming to a head here. Usually the rule with triangles is they usually like to resolve about two-thirds the apex. So if we go and uh, just eyeball this, just lining up all these lines, I have no idea if this is accurate. Something along those lines. Eh? Something like that. Um, so that gives us uh, 45 bars, so uh, two-thirds of 45. Who's got their thinking cap on? Somebody knows that math stuff. I was uh, never really good at math. So. 45 times 0.66 equals 29 bars. Let's call it 30. So we'll go, zoop. where is 30? Somewhere in there. So my hunch is we're probably going to resolve this somewhere right around there. So why don't we keep that on the screen just for kicks and see what happens. Point here is, um, you know, in days gone by, um, um, we had to finish this correction with one final move to the downside. I like that thinking. You can see the big hole in the profile here. Nice big dump and then, you know, a bunch of panicking and backfilling. That would fill that in nicely. So, you know, aesthetically it makes sense. The only issue here, of course, uh, we got some pretty crazy macro drivers going on. I mean, if all hell breaks loose and, you know, the world goes to fucking hell in a handbasket here, could we get a panic run into this thing to break it out through the top? Sure, wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, our rule, generally speaking, is we would ideally like to see a W come in on the other side of this trend line for us to really sort of set up a trade. It might be really fast, right? It might be like that and take off. We saw that on Ethereum the other day. So, uh, you know, be, be forewarned. I mean, I'm not saying it's here now. And I think I said in recent public videos, gun to my head, if I was, you know, Brian, I want to do a trade here. What are you doing? I would say a uh, knee-jerk reaction is short against those highs. Um, I don't have enough, you know, candle structure-wise yet to justify a trade. But if we finish today like today, or, you know, if we finish today like this and we paint an inside bar failure tomorrow, you all know that's a sell signal. And that's the, you know, hopefully you guys are, especially you people on YouTube, you're getting the idea that it's not like I reinvent this shit. After a while, you should all look at this chart and go, I know what he's going to say next. All right. If you actually get to the point where uh, you see me drawing reload zones and we're drawing trend lines and then you start seeing candles that are inside of this, you should all start going, I know what's coming next. I know what's coming next. Uh, and that's the cool part about what we do here is we, we, you know, we don't reinvent the story on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. It's the same thing just done day in, day out, rinse and repeat. So, you know, for those people that would be interested in taking short shots up against the top here, what does that sort of look like? Um, we had, uh, this is the hourly chart. I don't really spend a lot of time talking to the public about hourly charts. I mean, obviously, you have to be quick on your toes. Up and down like a horse drawers, all that kind of talk. But you can see reload zones. It's interesting how they painted a higher high here. 
You know, if I actually saw that this was a divergence, oh boy, would that ever get my attention. Uh, no, looks like we went to a higher high, so not terribly dramatic. Um, looks like they were trying to paint some sort of momentum resolution. You can kind of see here how, you know, if we go like this. Oh, really, hell, you can go all the way back here, right? So you can see there was something building, and I might even still be building here. Um, I hate when momentum does this because it means, you know, there. Uh, in fact, actually, it looks like we could probably work our way back up against these highs here. Uh, and the coil is continuing. Coil, coil, coil. Um, so I don't have the divergence. It's like, all right, this price is a lot weaker than it's showing you. Get ready to hunt an M. It's not there yet. So I'm just going to cool my jets and just wait and watch. And if anything, ironically enough, that would be perfect going back to this story. Because this is really what I think is going to happen here. Is uh, we're just going to go sideways. And it's going to drive people crazy here over the next few days. We'll see what happens. That's, that's what I'm thinking is going to happen. In fact, actually, there was another chart that I was posting. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, where are you, Bitcoin charts? Uh, Bitcoin charts, wasting everybody's time. We're having fun. Maybe not. Huh. I wonder what that means. You know what? Maybe it's over on this public one that I do. Uh, where is that over here? Uh, uh, this is a stock market. Over here. Oh, great. Now I've lost my chart. Ah, fudgicles. Oh, well. Guess it wasn't meant to be. Anyway, um, I do a uh, little chart deck for the public. Usually I have it over here. Uh, but I don't see it anywhere. Usually it's right there. Hmm. Fudge. Darn. Oh, well. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, so uh, where should we go next? Uh, maybe we talk a little Ethereum. Nice to see, Ben. The uh, crypto market is sure is trying to W out here. I do like, um, you know, like the value proposition of crypto in here. Um, nice to see everybody's back above Contango and Ethereum and Litecoin looking much healthier. That's good. I uh, didn't like to see how there was a premium on Phoenix overnight, i.e. tether buying. Um, what I wanted to look at, which was really interesting, was uh, Ethereum's price action here. So I think I put sort of tweets out to the effect, not really too interested in Bitcoin. Litecoin looks like it broke a downward channel, but that's not really overly bullish. The one that really jumped out at me was this crazy-ass Ethereum. So, uh, remember I had said earlier, sometimes when you get these breakouts, you got to wait for a consolidation and then go. This was very, very fast. Could you have traded that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. That would have been difficult. It was basically a classic Wyckovian check, right? Just came back down. There was so much buying demand here. Market was like, nope, not interested whatsoever. Let's go. So, you know, we might very easily just inside bar failure here, which would mean that the rally in the short term is done. Uh, for those people that are playing the head and shoulders, my feeling here would be like, you know, if we crap out and we have to come right back down to this, probably best just to walk away. It means that whatever the inertia here that launched us, it's gone. So um, that's probably the way I would have approached this. And really, actually, this is exactly the same if we look at it from the bot perspective. 
Um, so we had this uh, bot set up. Uh, pretty solid level. Right? You can see the inverted head and shoulders. Nice W. I mean, solid level. And I think I even put like... Um, uh, put a, a a tweet out, or maybe it was in like one of the public videos, where I was like, you know, if you say that bot is your trading plan, that's the setup that you actually trade, and you didn't take this setup, well, pff, you know, that's actually a worse mistake in my eyes than had you taken this bot setup and you got stopped out at a loss. This is where a lot of people fail when it comes to trading. The setup comes in, levels fire, and you just sit there and watch. So, you know, if you are a bot trader, you should be long this setup. And you notice that it had moved stop to a scratch level hit there at 245. So what that means is if we do come back down to this uh, entry level, you should just walk away. So, like I said, that kind of corresponds. You don't really want to see a winning trade turn into a losing trade. At the very least, I think people who had taken these, uh, either whether it be the inverted head and shoulders or whether it be the bot, you know, worst case scenario, you really don't want to see this turn into a losing trade. Um, did you know, I think definitely, you know, like people who are watching this video and like, hey, I want to be a trader. I want, you know, like I'm totally crypto focused and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, living in mom's basement, whatever. Not even really seeing what's going on out there in the world. I had made references recently that everything was set up that if crypto wanted to rally, the, the light was green. It was just a question of would buyers show up. Now, you, you all tell me. When people turn on their television sets, um, when uh, people um, turn on their computers, does anybody even use America Online anymore? You've got mail. Remember those days? I mean, are people feeling like, you know what, eh, I'm feeling pretty good. Eh? Man, there's this crypto market. It's a whole new idea. Let's go have some fun. Or are people kind of like, oh, holy Jesus Christ, uh, where's that bunker? Did we did we finish building the bunker yet? <laughs> I mean, you tell me. Uh, I get the impression that people are very bunkery, not speculative-y. So with that backdrop, I actually think it does make sense that in a weird sort of way, the absolutely over-the-top event that happened in the United States yesterday uh, it has taken a lot of the wind out of, if there was any kind of rally to happen here, I think it's taken a lot of the wind out of those sales. You know, somebody was asking if we should do a coinage show. Uh, you know, those people are headquartered in um, uh, St. Paul and uh, Minneapolis. I mean, honestly, if you're interested in coinage, reach out to them and just ask them if they're doing okay right now. Um you know, uh, um, you know, <laughs> maybe that's a way you can help the crypto community is just simply uh, reaching out and saying, hey, uh, is there anything I can do to help? So I do understand to a certain degree it actually makes complete sense that, yeah, things were ready to rock and roll. We were all like, okay, if it's a bull, let's go make some bacon. And everything just went, ugh. And that's kind of what I'm seeing is that a lot of things just over the weekend they just went oh my god so i mean like uh, you know as I, I said there a moment ago i mean the great part about it is if it, you know there were names that are firing and there were just working away you know i thought this neo is a really good example of just yet another another bot just working away so you can see one low two lows three lows really nice structure off the 25 level it's ha had its move uh, stop to scratch level. Same logic here. If this craps out, you just walk away at scratch. So what? Um, and there are names like this ADA. Jesus, H. Christ, look at this thing taking off here. So, you know, there are names that are rocking and rolling. Um, and actually, it's really interesting. I wanted to find a longer-term chart of ADA. I, I, you know, this is the kind of image that you see at the long-term bottom of a bear market. 
<laughs> we saw a similar action on uh, Bitcoin back in 2015, I remember. So I'm starting to think that not only is this a big run, and of course we can't chase, don't chase, don't chase, but I'm actually feeling like now we can actually start thinking like pullbacks are buying opportunities kind of idea. Um, think, you know, like I said, I, I'll probably look at this chart a little bit more in detail on different exchanges and higher time frames and stuff, but I'm getting the feeling like, you know, and I've said this repeatedly over the past few months, it sure feels like this crypto. The altcoin market, it's like everybody wants to dog them and beat them up, and okay, so be it. You like bitcoins, yeah, you like uh, cryptocurrencies, you like altcoins, whatever. But what I've noticed is these things are not, you know, ski sloping down anymore. They're actually going the other direction. And, of course, when will the public go, oh, yeah, you know what? Crypto is a really good time to buy. <laughs> When's that going to be? <laughs> when these things are like 10x, 100x higher, right? Isn't that the way the game is played? All right. So. Okay, everyone. Um, I hope Level Winners, I gave you a little bit of uh, help with the shares outstanding conversation. We did end up here at the end of the broadcast talking a little crypto. Um, I did answer two questions off of that Q&A sheet. Um, I've been talking forever here now. I mean, I sure hope you guys are going to get some value. I know I'm going to get a bunch of downvotes here, so have fun. Uh, Yeah, why don't we, um, let's talk uh, the, okay, we did talk, oh, that was last week's questions. Okay, so yeah, last week we did spend quite a bit of time talking about the cycles. Okay, I think we'll probably leave it at that. Hope you guys over on YouTube got some value out of this. Um, try and understand that while school's in, I really want to focus in on uh, trying to dovetail this with what they're learning in the current week. Um, and, um, you know, what a crazy year, eh? Try and uh, try and play from a position of strength. Um, be diversified if that's a bunch of different currencies, if it's a bunch of different assets like stocks and bonds, if it's you know some commodities to, uh, like Bitcoin and gold and silver. I think you know just try and be really well diversified. Um, and then that way, if uh, if one thing goes to ratchet, your whole portfolio doesn't fall apart. So. Okay, everybody, I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the offering. Um, see you all, uh, I suppose, maybe for a daily brief recap in the coming week. And, of course, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out and ask. All right, everybody, all the best, and bye for now.